Hey, good afternoon. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm SVP Quantum Technologies and Systems Products at D-Wave. I work with the teams that are building our quantum annealing and gate model quantum computers. You know, it's been a recurring theme at our staff meetings for the last little while that somebody or other will usually comment how well the technology development seems to be going. Uh, to the point where it's actually creating a, a, a sense of excitement, a palpable buzz amongst my colleagues and I for what that's going to mean for our, our next generation products. So if I'm only able to do one thing this afternoon, I'd like to share some of that with you and give you a sense of what it is that we're excited about and why. So the last time we got together uh, at Qubits, uh, we were a little over a year ago, uh, we announced our, and released our Clarity Roadmap, our product roadmap, where we're describing uh, all the products that D-Wave is developing, how we see them unfolding going forward, uh, and how they relate to each other. And that includes uh, current and future plans for annealing quantum computers, our roadmap towards developing a gate model quantum computer. Uh, it includes a discussion of, of uh, our uh, LEAP, our real-time quantum cloud service, and also Ocean, our open source suite of tools. Uh, in, in the next few minutes, I'm going to be focusing just on the top two rows there. And in particular, I want to dive in and talk about our annealing quantum computers. So also, at the last, uh, last Qubits meeting, we announced a performance update to Advantage. Uh, at 5,000 Qubits, woven together in an architecture in which each Qubit is connected to 15 other Qubits, this is the largest uh, most densely connected and powerful quantum computer uh, built to date. Uh, since that time, we now have developed to the point where we have three of these Advantage systems uh, available in LEAP and hosted in, in distinct geographical locations that Alan alluded to. We have one at the University of Southern California, the Information Sciences Institute. There's one at Ulich Forschung Centrum, a high-performance computing facility in Westphalia, Germany. And we're hosting one in our facility in Burnaby in British Columbia. These systems are at the back end of all of our hybrid, all of our hybrid solvers. Before talking about where we're going next, I want to put this processor in the, this system in the context of all the quantum computers that D-Wave has provisioned and built to date and demonstrated. Shown here in blue dots on this plot, where the y-axis is the sum of the number of qubits plus the number of intercubit couplers as a, as a kind of a measure for the scale and the complexity uh, of the processor. This plot includes all five successive generations of commercially available quantum computers that D-Wave has brought forth, including going back a little over a decade ago to the D-Wave 1, uh, and then culminating with the Advantage Performance Update that I was just talking to you about. On the upper right hand of this plot, in orange, is Advantage 2. This is what's coming next. With over 7,000 qubits uh, put together in a new architecture where each qubit is connected to 20 other qubits. Uh, and then in a way that is not captured at all in this plot, this Advantage 2 will be built in an entirely new integrated circuit process, redesigned from the ground up uh, for the end to the end of increasing qubit coherence time uh, as that translates into better optimization performance. So I'm going to talk more about uh, coherence later, but let's just acknowledge that that's an awful lot to change all at once. Uh, scale, architecture, fabrication technology. To try and disentangle uh, and set factor out the complexity associated with building a new fabrication stack from that of developing a completely new processor architecture, we undertook a project to build a smaller scale, sort of around 500 qubit prototype of the Advantage 2 architecture, but built with a technology that we used to build uh, Advantage, the Advantage processor, the already established integrated circuit technology. And this actually unfolded much better than, honestly, I was expecting, where the very first lots fabricated of the very first drawing of the processor uh, ended up yielding and working, and we were able to, to get it to the point of a working processor. 
I'll, I'll be honest with you, it, it doesn't always work out that well, but we'll take it. Uh, so at the end, we accomplished the goal of the projects, but then at the end of the day, we had these small scale working processors that pound for pound were actually outperforming uh, the advantage performance update on problems that were sized to fit on either one of them. So smaller, but pound for pound, qubit for qubit, more powerful. And this without yet harnessing the performance benefit that we're expecting to get from the improved qubit coherence. This all just from the improved qubit design and the, and the more dense architecture. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about coherence in a minute. I'd like to take a, 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 a detour here and, uh, and motivate a little bit more why we're interested in coherence and give you a sense of why we think it's important by talking about some recent quantum simulation work uh, that my colleague uh, Andrew King will be talking to you about in much more detail a little bit later in the program. And the point is that it is now possible, it is now technologically possible to anneal these quantum, annealing quantum computers fast enough that we can, uh, we can run the algorithm in a purely coherent annealing uh, regime. So what Andrew will be describing in a, in a bit more detail is a, there's a paper that was published, uh, I think in the fall, where he and collaborators at D-Wave, at University of Southern California, at Tokyo Technical University, and also at Saitama Medical University, uh, performed a quantum simulation of a system of 2,000 qubits uh, and, and studied and demonstrated uh, this uh, physical mechanism called the kibble zurich mechanism. Andrew's gonna describe that to you in more detail. I wanna draw your attention in particular to zoom in on one plot from that work shown here. On the y-axis of that plot is residual energy, residual energy. So for context, the lower on, lower on that plot, less residual energy, better performance in an optimization context. And on the x-axis in that plot is the annealing time, the amount of time we allow for the annealing algorithm to unfold. And on the right side of that plot, so to this side, we've got shorter annealing times, that's faster. And to the, the, the sorry, the, this other right side of the plot, uh, on this side of the plot, we have longer annealing times or slower. Also shown on this, in the green dashed lines, are a theoretical and numerical simulation for what you would expect for purely coherent Schrodinger equation dynamics uh, as, as, as in, uh, up to the, the, the scale of the system, the 2,000 qubit system. And on this plot, man, they, they reflect themselves, they manifest in a straight line. And what we see in the data, uh, this is shown for a couple of different uh, coupling strengths. And what the data show, what the quantum annealing experiments show is that for shortest anneal times, we're following along exactly, hewing exactly to the prediction for purely coherent annealing. And then at some longer time, when the annealing time gets to be of the scale of the decoherence time for the system, we depart from that purely coherent behavior. And that departure is manifested in excess residual energy, or slightly, slightly worse performance. And in this picture, it's relatively straightforward to imagine and understand that if we can increase the coherence time of the individual qubits, we can push that point of departure further to the right, pull the curve down, and that's resulting in better optimization performance. Uh, my colleague, Andrew King, is gonna describe this research uh, much more clearly than I'm gonna be able to, and he's also gonna talk about an even more recent work where we're able to see in a 5,000 qubit system of a cubic spin glass problem, uh, similar types of dynamics and the same basic message. You improve the qubit coherence, you're gonna get better optimization performance. So, okay, maybe you buy that. There we go. But the question is, Mark, are you going to be able to deliver on better qubit coherence? And the answer is that yes, yes we will. And what I'm really excited to show you here for the first time is a comparison of some noise performance, cubic device noise performance, between qubits that were built as part of the, uh, the experimental uh, Advantage II prototype that I talked about a couple of charts ago in red that was fabricated with our extant 
established advantage fabrication process. And now recently, in the blue, Qubits fabricated in an experimental prototype, advantage to architecture, but fabricated in the, in the new lower noise fabrication stack. So this is significant because now we've been able to build up the, fab, the new fabrication stack to the point that we can actually build a processor in it and start extracting data from it. In this plot, we're showing between red and blue, it's simply the power spectral density of low frequency flux noise. And it's easy to see that the blue curve is lower than the red curve, less noise. On the right, we've got narrower, in blue, narrower macroscopic resonant tunneling peaks, that which is a measure of integrated flux noise over some uh, spectrum bandwidth. My colleague, Emil Hoskinson, is going to describe these plots in a bit more detail later. But the, but the takeaway message, the bottom line with both of these, is that they are consistent with about a 4x reduction in flux noise across a broad spectrum uh, of, of, of qubit uh, energy. And, uh, we know from our device physics that this is going to correspond to a significant increase in qubit coherence. That we see here is going to be manifest in the fabric of the new processor, the Advantage 2 processor. And we're really excited about this and what this is going to mean for the performance uh, of, our, of our next generation product. So that's where we're headed with quantum annealing. We also talked about at the uh, qubits, a couple of uh, last qubits, we announced that we were developing a gate model quantum computer. And let me remind you why it is that we thought that this, that why it is that we're doing this. So quantum annealing and gate model are different modalities for performing quantum computing that end up being fairly complementary to each other in how they play into customer applications. Quantum, annealers, quantum annealing computers today are much more effective than gate model quantum computers today at performing combinatorial optimization problems, whether that's manufacturing uh, optimization or shipping logistics or employee scheduling. They're much more performant today across the board for this class of problems. And actually, now we understand that they probably always will be. However, there are certainly problems, uh, particularly related to uh, solving differential equations, to performing some kinds of quantum simulation, uh, to solving quantum chemistry problems, where uh, gate model quantum computers are, are pretty clearly going to be the best choice. So we would like to be able to address problems across the whole array of quantum applications for customers. And so we saw the wisdom in undertaking a program to build a gate model quantum computer. And we sketched out a roadmap uh, that we feel is synergistic with continued investment and development of progressively more powerful annealing quantum computers. Namely, uh, built on top of a superconducting uh, flux-like qubit within a multi-layer integrated circuit fabrication stack that allows us then to harness and take advantage of all of the control circuitry, embedded control circuitry, on-chip technology that has allowed us to build a scalable technology uh, with annealing-based quantum computers. And, and since the time of our announcement, we've made a number of uh, steps along this path. Uh, we've fabricated uh, and, and started testing uh, our, our gate model qubit, our first generation gate model qubit, uh, again, within an integrated circuit fabrication stack, and are performing one and two qubit uh, gates with that. Uh, we've demonstrated uh, a, a unique approach, uh, which we think is much more efficient and certainly much more scalable uh, to performing uh, readout. Uh, readout in a, in a gate model context. Uh, and then we've actually uh, completed the first pass at a design of a logical qubit, which will be an error-corrected logical qubit, uh, that's scalable in the sense that it has embedded within it, again, all the necessary control circuitry to scale up to a useful application scale. And by scalable, I mean that we can, we can see how, at a systems level, to scale up to a scale that will be relevant for, for business problems without necessarily growing a forest of microwave-compatible coaxial lines that are arrayed in some ever more enormous cryogenic systems that you see in some of the, some of the other efforts. So we're pretty excited about where this is going. Um, but I do have to say, to, to, to put this in context, it will be many years, it will be a long time before gate model quantum computing as an approach will be able to bring the same kind of business value uh, that we can get today 
in annealing quantum computers. So I just want to be, we should be realistic and clear about that. So that's our gate model quantum computing program. Uh, I talked to you a bit about uh, our annealing quantum computers and why we're excited about that and about the new coherence. And I guess I have to say, uh, watching the program this morning, that I was really blown away looking all at the same time at all the different applications that folks are using our existing uh, systems and, and technology and products uh, to, to bring value uh, to, their, to, your, to your businesses. And honestly, I can't wait to see what you all are going to be able to do with what comes next. So uh, maybe if just to leave you with a thought, if you're curious about how to get, uh, you know, how, how quantum may be able to bring value to your own business, uh, whether or not you've started down that, that path or just maybe this is your first foray uh, in, into understanding what quantum may offer, I would encourage you to consider reaching out to our D-Wave launch program which gives you access to world-class professional services that understand very well how to apply uh, uh, quantum technologies to solve various types of problems. And, and won't necessarily be expert in your business problems, but they will absolutely be expert in uh, how to solve problems with quantum computing. And they can work with you from ideation, conceptualization, all the way up through production, uh, as we've seen in a number of cases. So that, thank you.